Hi, my name's Pat Schloss. I'm a hater. <laughs> well, that might not be too surprising to many of you, but up until about four or five years ago, I absolutely refused to use dplyr, ggplot, or other packages that are now part of what we call the tidyverse. Why? Well, because it worked for me, right? I was able to use the functions and functionality built into base R really effectively, and I thought it was really empowering to know how to do things using the built-in features of the language without having to add other packages. But as I've learned, it's a hell of a lot easier to use things in the tidyverse. But every now and then I do need to go back and use things from uh, base R. And so today I'm gonna show you how we can dip our toes back into base R to do some pretty cool things, including using other packages that just aren't part of the tidyverse. Hey folks, I'm Pat Schloss and really, I'm a lover, not a hater. Anyway, for the past few episodes of Code Club, we've been making an ordination, trying to improve its appearance and trying to make it easier for our audience to read and understand. Well, as we've been going through that, I've been kind of implicitly or explicitly, I guess, saying that the three different treatment groups that I see in the visual are significantly different from each other. Maybe I didn't say significantly, but I've been saying they're different from each other, right? And, and perhaps you've been taking me at my word at that, right? Well, someone in the comments on a recent episode actually called me on that and said, you know, there, you said dude, there's a way to test whether or not those three groups are significantly different from each other. How would we go about doing that? Well, you're in the right place because today I'm gonna show you how we can do that. I like to go back to the data, back to that distance matrix and ask the question, are the distances between samples from the same group smaller than smaller or shorter, closer to each other than perhaps the distance between, sam between samples from different groups, right? So if we look at our ordination, we see at the bottom, we have samples from healthy individuals. And up at the top, we have samples from people with diarrhea and samples from people that with diarrhea and who are positive for C. difficile. So it looks like they're different, but are they? And so again, we're gonna use that distance matrix approach of trying to understand whether the distances within a group are um, smaller than the distances between samples from different groups. To do that, we can use a package in R called vegan that has a really useful function called Adonis. Now, Adonis has many, many, many different names. In the mother package, we have a program called AMOVA. In other programs, it's called PermDist. Other places, it's called NPANOVA or NPAMOVA. Uh, it's all the same function, and it um, comes from a paper by McArdle and Anderson. And it, it is wonderful because it allows us, again, to compare the distances within groups to the distances between groups. So I'm gonna show you how we do this in Adonis. And along the way, I'm gonna show you different places where it pays to know a little bit about base R functionality, how it works with elements of the tidyverse. And so what I would like to do is today we're gonna create a script that will run the Adonis analysis to tell us if either of the three groups uh, are different from each other. And then that will then do a pairways analysis to compare the pairs of those three different groups to confirm that they're significantly different from each other. And we will also then uh, correct for multiple comparisons to see that, see whether or not our p-values are all less than 0.05 when we correct for those multiple comparisons. Coming into R Studio, I'm going to create a new R script. We're gonna start with library um, tidyverse, because we will use some elements of the tidyverse. Read Excel, and we'll also do library vegan. So if you don't have vegan installed, go ahead and install it because um, that is important <laughs> for today's analysis. So uh, coming back to Schubert, I'm going to go ahead and read, copy this line for reading in the metadata. Um, I also want the distance matrix. So I will then do um, distance. And here it's important to know that the distance matrix isn't really well formed. If I open up schubert.breakcurtis.dist, we see it's got kind of a funky format. One other thing I wanna comment on is that I updated this file in the repository that you all originally installed for from. So you wanna have, be sure you have a version 0.3 to get this to work. Um, this is what's called a square matrix 
It is a filip formatted square matrix. So the first value, the first row is the number of samples. So 338 samples and then all of these. So I could make my life a little bit easier by deleting that 338, but I don't wanna to touch that. I wanna leave my raw data raw. That's a really fundamental part of reproducible research. So we'll keep that and I will do read TSV and we will then do raw data forward slash Schubert dot Bray Curtis dot dist. And I don't want that first row. I don't care about the number of samples because read TSV can figure that out for me. So I will do skip equals one. I'll also do call names equals false because I don't have any call names in there, right? So if you look at this, there's no column names. Um, and if we run that, oh, I think I forgot to, I forgot to actually run all this stuff. <laughs> okay, so I think, I think it might be call underscore names. Yeah. And so we see that it reads it in, the default specification is call double, but x1, column x1 is call character. So let's look at what distance looks like now. And we see we've got a whole bunch of columns, uh, but we see X1 is the name of our sample IDs. What I'd like to do now is fix my column IDs. How do we do this? Well, I'll of course show you how. So this is where uh, a little bit of base R knowledge comes in handy. So if I do call names distance and run that, I get all of the column names as a vector from my distance matrix. Uh, from my distance file. And what I can do then is I can assign values to this to write over the column names. It's pretty slick. So what I could do would be to do um, C and my first column is the group. And then I need the names of all these other samples. Well, how do I get that? So let me step back a step. If I do distance again, we get this distance matrix. The column names for like X2 through X I don't know, what is it, 339 or whatever, are the values in column X1. And so if I, I can get access to X1 by several different ways. So one way that we've perhaps seen in the past would be to use select. We could do select X1. This actually creates a data frame with a column called X1. That's not exactly what I want. I want X1 as a vector, right? So to get a vector, I could instead do pull x1. So pull x1 returns x1 as a vector. Um, the same thing could be done without the pipe. So I could do pull distance um, x1, and that will get me the same result, okay? So this syntax is easy, it's convenient, it's intuitive, but it's a little bit verbose. How else can we get the same information? Well. I can do x1 and then square brace and then inside that, or I'm sorry, not x1, distance, square brace, x1. And so this square brace notation is basically the same thing as select, that this then pulls out a column from the, dist from the matrix uh, from column x1. Again, that's not what I want, I want a vector. So if I want the vector, I use the double bracket notation and that gets me that. I can do distance dollar sign x1, and that dollar sign is the same thing as what we see up here with the double brackets. Um, which you use really depends on the context and what you're comfortable doing. So what we can do here then is we could set call names distance to do group, and then we could say distance dollar sign x1, and if I run just that part of the expression, I see that I get all the names of the samples and that my first element is group. So now, if I run call names distance and then I look at distance, I see that I've got all these column names now that have the, um, the same thing as the sample name and the first column is my group. So we're in good shape. So I'm gonna uh, leave that and that we now have column names for all of our samples. So the next thing I wanna do that I've already shown you, um, although I haven't talked about it explicitly, is an inner join. And so I will do inner join on 
uh, distance and metadata, and then by equals, and this is the column that I'm joining on. Um, I don't know why, but I, I could have, let me rename this sample ID. I don't know why I didn't do that initially, uh, because if I use sample ID, then that's the same column in metadata and distance, and it makes it easier to join the two data frames. So I'll do sample ID. Um, so I have to rerun everything. Um, and then I can do here sample ID, and it joins the data frame. And um, at the very end are all of my um, metadata variables that I might be interested in using. Uh, so that's good. Um, so I can see those. Why don't I go ahead and switch the order here? So metadata distance by sample ID. And so now I see my metadata as well as my sample IDs. So we're in good shape. I will go ahead and call this meta uh, distance. So to run Adonis and Vegan, I need to have my distance matrix, and I also need to have a column uh, for the different variables. But those need to be in separate data frames. Um, so something I should point out is that Adonis allows you to give it your feature table, so what we call in Mother a shared table. Um, I find that that's, it's a little bit slow. It is very slow running that through Adonis. And Mother has some features such as being able to rarefy the data so all your samples have the same number of reads. Um, that is now built into Vegan, but it's quite slow. So I did that distance matrix calculation in Mother and we're bringing that into Adonis. But again, I, have a dis I need a distance matrix and I also need um, a column or a, um, a data frame that has explanatory variables. So like my, 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 um, my patient health status, okay? So to get the distance matrix, I'll call this all dist, and I will pull this out of meta distance. And I wanna select the columns that correspond to the rows that I have, to the, to the samples I have. And so I'll do a select, and I can then say all of, and I then want the values that are in the group column. So I'm inclined to do group, um, but this isn't gonna work because group not found. And what I need to do instead is I'm giving this a vector of group names. I could do like, you know, meta distance dollar sign group. Um, oh, I got to spell it right though. Um, oh, and that should be sample ID, right? So that would work and that would give me all dist. And that then gives me a data frame of 338 by 338. I can see it's a symmetric data frame. Uh, that's nice. Uh, but to kind of motivate things that we're going to do here in a moment, I'm going to revert back to that square notation. And perhaps you've seen this before, but you can use a period to indicate the data that's flowing through the pipeline. So I want to take the data that's flowing through the pipeline, and I'm going to put uh, square brackets around the name of the column I want. And this then will, again, give me the same thing that I had before. But as we go down and we think about subsetting to do pairwise comparisons, this structure will be um, much easier to work with. So I can then do as.dist, and that will turn all dist into a distance matrix, which is what the input needs to be going into Adonis. Now we want to run Adonis, so we'll do Adonis, and then we'll do all dist tilde, and so this is a um, formula notation. So all dist, explained by some other variable. And so um, I can never keep these variable names straight. Uh, and so if I look at the different columns here, the one that I want to use um, is the disease stat, right? So this one here. And so I can do all dist explained by disease underscore stat, comma, and then I'll say take disease stat from whatever I give the data argument. So I can then say meta distance, and I can then run it. And this is a permutation-based test. It does 999 permutations, um, and it tells this gives me my ANOVA table, and I see that I get a p-value of one in a thousand. I only did a thousand iterations, so I could update this to do permutations equals. Uh, say 10,000. And this will take 10 times longer to run, but will give me greater precision 
on my p-value. So that took a few moments to run, but we can see that we get an even smaller p-value because we're again testing at um, a higher number of permutations. Ultimately, you know, the, the size of your p-value is not uh, the relative size of your p-value is not significant or meaningful. I shouldn't use significant so freely. Um, I'm interested in whether or not it's less than 0 0.05. It's either less than 0 0.05 or it isn't. Um, and that's the model we're using. So what I'll do uh, as we're testing here is I'm going to create a variable up here that I'll call permutations. And for now, I'll use a 1,000. And I can then set this here to be permutations. Because then when I run it for actually doing the analysis, I could jack it up to 10,000 or 100,000 to get, get greater precision. But as I'm testing, I don't really want to mess around with that so much. You know, you might think about, you know, how can we extract that p-value? Well, I can, I can save this as all test. And let's go ahead and put these arguments on separate lines so it doesn't scroll off the side of the screen. And so again, all test is going to output this ANOVA table but I want, say, this value here, right? So how do I get that? Well, a useful tool for parsing things like this is called str. And so you can do str all test. And this then shows you the structure, which is what str is short for, of the output. And so this ANOVA table is a nice output of all this data. And this data is formatted as a list. And so a list is kind of like a vector. Um, I guess a vector is probably a list, but like a vector where each cell of the vector is perhaps a different type of data. And so a, so a vector really is a list where everything is of the same type. Anyway, if I want AOV tab, I see that convenient dollar sign, right? So I could perhaps do all test dollar sign AOV tab dollar sign PR greater than F, right? So let's give that a shot and see if that works. So if we do all test dollar sign AOV dot tab dollar sign PR greater than F, and you'll see it put it in those nice back ticks for me. If I run that, I now get out a vector of P values. And so again, if I look back up here, that's these three values, right? And I want seat one, so I can do square bracket one, and that gets me then um, my p-value, right? So another way that we could write that, we've already seen this with the double bracket versus dollar sign notation, would be all test and then square brackets, aov.tab, just need one period, uh, and then again, in the double square brackets, uh, pr uh, greater than f, run that, we get our vector again, and then we can do dot, uh, square bracket one to get the first seat. So these two, get you the same result. Um, I think I'm going to use the double bracket notation because it's, it's a little bit easier to read, I think. I don't know. Um, and so we'll do all p as that. And so now we have all p stored as a variable. Before I move on, I wanna show you a couple other things that we can do with Adonis. So this is a fairly simple experimental design in how we're running Adonis. We've got a, um, a y variable, our distance matrix. We've got an x variable, the explanatory variable, which are the three different disease stats, statuses. So we have healthy, we have diarrhea, and diarrhea plus C. diff. Well, if I wanted to say add gender, I could do star gender, run that, and that will then include gender as a covariate. And we then see um, that we have that Gender itself is not significant. Its p-value is like 0.26. Um, and that the interaction term actually is 0.04. Again, this is based on a permutation-based test. We should be setting a random number generator. And so maybe up here, I will go ahead and do set.seed. And I'll put in my, my birth date, 1976, 06, 20. And that way, then, whenever we run this script, we'll get the same output every time. So that's one way we could put in gender. Uh, we could put in race, um, and so race um, does not uh, is not significant. There's not a significant interaction. Um, you know, you could do race and gender. Uh, you can you can do all sorts of things with the model um, as you define it here. Great, our p value comparing all three treatment groups is significant. All that means is that one of the three groups at least is significant from the others. That raises the question then of well. 
which pairs are different from each other. If this p-value had been greater than 0.05, we'd be done, and we'd say there's no difference between the three groups. But because our p-value is significant, we're now able to take the next step and to say what pairs of samples are significantly different from each other. Now that's where this starts getting a little bit hairy um, and how we're gonna subset from all tests to get the different comparisons. Before I do that, I wanna make sure that I know what those different treatment groups are called. And so I will then say meta distance uh, and I'll do count on disease stat. And so I know I have case, diarrheal control and non-diarrheal control. Um, and, and so now we want a subset for those three different comparisons between case, diarrheal control, case, non-diarrheal control, and between diarrheal control, non-diarrheal control. So I'm going to copy this code because I'm gonna build my subsetting off of that. So I'm gonna call this case uh, versus diarrheal control and we'll build this out and then we'll replicate it for the other two. So meta distance, I then wanna do filter disease stat equals equals case or disease stat equals equals diarrheal control. So I could have said disease stat not equal to non-diarrheal control, but I like being explicit in what I want rather than what I don't want. And this then will give me, if I run these two lines, um, this will give me 183 rows for again, um, my case and diarrheal control. Uh, but I need to then make sure that the columns I'm pulling here correspond to the rows that I have. And so that way then I now have this select all of sample ID. And again, this is why <laughs> I did that up ahead. And again, we look at this and we see that we've got 183 rows in our distance matrix. So I'm gonna call this case diarrhea. Um, and so I realize that I need a metadata file and a distance matrix file. So I'm gonna do case diarrhea there, and I will uh, do a case diarrhea uh, dist here, where I give it case diarrhea, right? And so that way when I call Adonis, let me go ahead and load these, that way when I run Adonis, I can do Adonis, and I can do case diarrhea dist, explained by disease stat data equals case diarrhea, and I'll do permutations equals permutations. Let's give this a run. And so here we see that the case samples, the C. diff positive, and the diarrheal samples are significantly different from each other um, at a p-value of about 0 0.002. Excellent. So I will call this case diarrhea test, right? And again, let me go ahead and put these on separate lines so you can see them on the screen. And if I wanna get case diarrhea uh, p, then I could do uh, case diarrhea test. And again, coming back up to here, I can copy this down, add that, and uh, let me go ahead and run this so we see what the p-value is. Uh, so I gotta run this. I, when I ran it before, I didn't assign it to the test variable. And so if I look at case diarrhea p, I get that p-value that we saw previously. Now, I don't wanna save this as an individual p-value. I wanna actually create a vector that has the three p-values for the three pairwise tests. So I will go ahead and call this um, pairwise p, and I need to initialize it as a numeric vector. Again, this is a little bit of base R knowledge. And that way then, what I can do is call this pairwise p, and I will uh, put that in square, and put that in a quote, and I'll get rid of that, I have an underscore p. So now if I look at pairwise p, it's a vector uh, that's got names for each of the seats. So what I need to do now is to replicate this for the other two comparisons. So I will copy this down. Uh, this is, if you're familiar with my other work in talking about reproducibility, this is not what we would call dry. Don't repeat yourself. I could create a function, but again, that's not what I wanna emphasize in today's episode. So I will do now case and non-diarrheal control, and I can copy that there, 
and I will call this case healthy because non-diarrheal controls are uh, the healthy people that don't have diarrhea. And I can then do case health here, uh, case health there. Uh, this is gonna be health, case health test, case health dist, case health. That's good. Um, and this again should be case health test. Again, this is why it pays to create a function to do all this because you don't have to worry about finding all the variables. So if I run this, and now I do pairwise p, I now see I've got both p values and the case health is less than one in a thousand. Good. Now I wanna do the third case of my diarrheal controls versus my cases. So I'll do diarrhea and I'll kind of copy this through. Um, and so again, this is diarrheal control. And so wherever I see case now, I'm gonna put in diarrhea health. I really hope all this talk of diarrhea doesn't scare you all off. <laughs> Maybe I should have thought of that before I picked this data set. Anyway, if the diarrhea bugs you, let me know down below in the notes. Um, and maybe I'll find a different data set if that annoys people. But hey, this is science. This is this is real life, right? Okay, so now if we look at pairwise p, we've got our three different p values, right? And they're all less than 0 0.05. They're actually all about you know one in a thousand or two in a thousand. The question then is because we're doing multiple tests with these multiple comparisons, we're increasing the probability that we would falsely reject the null hypothesis. So we need to correct our p-values for these repeated comparisons. There's a function in base R called p.adjust, and we can give it pairwise p. Running that, um, we then see our corrected p-values. Um, the default method for p adjust is the Holm method, which I don't really know. The method I like to use is BH for Benjamin Hotchberg. And so again, using that method, um, you get um, that correction. Uh, Benjamin Hotchberg is a little less conservative than the default methods and a lot less conservative than like a Bonferroni. Uh, you can look at the documentation for p adjust to see how you might go about doing that. Now, I wanna know, are these values all less than 0 0.05? So I could do less than 0 0.05, run that, they're all true, okay? So what I'd like to do is I want this script to get called by my Schubert nmds.r file. And I want this to run, and if they're not all significant, then I want like the analysis to stop and I wanna get an alert to that. So what I can do is I can say all around that. So what all does is it asks, are all of the values of the, of the values given to all, are they all true, right? So in this case, yes, they are all true, right? So true, right? And what I can then do is stop if not. So stop if not. So if, if the value inside of stop if not is false, it will stop. If it's true, it will keep going. And so you see nothing, right? So let me illustrate this. If I do pairwise p, and let me create something garbage, <laughs> uh, and I'll say that's equal to 0 0.5, right? And so now if I look at pairwise p, um, I've got garbage, and I've got at least one value that's not significant. So now if I do p adjust, right, I still have one value that's not significant. If I look at all, uh, they are not all true, so that's false. And so then stop if not, we'll give an error, right? So error, this is not true, okay? And so that would then stop the analysis. We, we don't have that garbage variable, uh, but this again is a test that we can use before proceeding with generating the figure to make sure that what we've got in our title and other places in our analysis are actually true. All right, so I will go ahead and save this I'll call this Schubert uh, NMDS, uh, uh, not NMDS, Schubert Adonis. Um, so now I can call this from my other file. I can then do 
source Schubert Adonis dot R. Um, and then if I run source on that, it will then run what's in that um, in that script. And everything went through just hunky dory, like everything was fine. And again, if one of those p values was false, it would stop before it goes on to make the rest of the figure. Uh, so that's pretty slick, right? If you recall, this code in the Schubert NMDS.R script generates this figure. Um, and so maybe what I could do is add a caption to the bottom uh, that indicates that all values were less than 0 0.05. Um, I don't know what this is going to do to our design aesthetic, but eh, it's okay. So I can then say caption equals um, all pairwise comparisons were significant using Adonis. Benjamin Hotchberg uh, correction for multiple comparisons. And I think I had a typo somewhere. Yeah, significant. Okay. Good. Uh, and if we go ahead and run all that, we then see <laughs> um, that it kind of runs off the side of the screen. Uh, that's okay. Um, we can, of course, go ahead and um, we can go ahead and put in a line break here. And it's it's right justifying it. And so maybe down here, I'll go ahead and do um, plot.caption uh, element text uh, hjust equals zero. We saw that last time, right? And so we see that we've got left justified. Uh, and so maybe I'll put the line break in after the using. So again, it doesn't totally fit with our aesthetic and how things look. But again, this gives you the idea of what's going on. And I believe we can do plot caption position equals plot. And that will justify it to the left side of the plot. So I hope you found this tutorial useful in talking about how sometimes we do need to dip our toes back into base R. Um, but there are certainly analogs with select and pull to the single bracket and double bracket notation. Um, we, we do appreciate select and all those helper functions that come with it. But sometimes when we're interfacing with things like Adonis that are outside of the tidyverse, um, it, it pays to know a little bit of base R and some of the functions that are there. There's other things you can do in vegan in terms of ordinations and things like that. There's another task that would be useful called um, that would allow you to look at the dispersion or whether or not the variation in the data is the same across your three different treatment groups. But I'll leave that for you to play with and leave that as an exercise for you. I believe you don't have to change much in those Adonis calls uh, to get that. And I believe the function is called permdist uh, if you want to check that out. Anyway, uh, I hope you like this. If you've got questions or if there's other things you would like to learn about or see, by all means, please let me know. Um, I'm grateful for the commenter who raised this point, and I'm happy to, to give you all the solutions. So anyway, uh, keep practicing with this and playing around. Please tell your friends about these episodes and be sure to hit the like button. It, it gives me all sorts of warm fuzzies and puts me in a far, far better mood than I normally am. You don't want me to be a hater. You want me to be a lover. <laughs> anyway, keep practicing. Tell your friends about Code Club, and we'll see you next time for another episode.